Good morning, good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to GCP Online Meetup episode 44. 44. Steph and I are super excited to have you with us. Uh, as always, my name is Yuri. I'm a customer engineer here at Google. I'm joined by Steph Wong. Hi, everyone. Stephanie Wong, customer engineer. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and today we are uh, really excited to talk about a topic that I think neither one of us really knows much about. Um, yeah. As you saw from the description, um, today we're going to be talking about Spinnaker, which is a uh, you know continuous deployment automation tool primarily focused on folks that do development. Um, my exposure to development has been very limited. Uh, like the last time I've really written any code that's made it, that actually made its way into production was about 2006 when I was writing Oracle stored procedures uh, for I think Oracle 8i. I'm oh, assuming wow. I know. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, this gray is, is, is earned. <laughs> um, what about you? I am in the exact same boat. So that's why I'm really excited that we're here today to learn. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and with us, we uh, have to save us from our collective ignorance. Um, Andrew Phillips from the Google product management team. Uh, Andrew would love to have you introduce uh, yourself to our audience. Hi, everyone. I'm really obviously thrilled to be on. 44, if you can see my fingers. Um, and I'm sure from the background, you can't, you won't have any idea what I'm going to talk about. So we're, we're going to, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Obviously very glad to be here. And I, I certainly hope that um, the product that you mentioned, Yuri, wasn't actually the cause of the gray hair. Although given my past experience, it's quite likely that it, it, it might be related. Uh, so it, I think a lot of it actually was. So this was when I was doing consulting um, as part of a bigger consulting company and we had a pretty demanding customer um, and I did a pretty terrible job of managing requirements and delivering on them. So yeah, a whole lot of stress that came out of it. I'm very glad not to be doing with that. I mean, with that anymore. I, we should have had Spinnaker back then. Uh, right? We, I, I think it would have made my life much easier. <laughs> um, so with that, again, Andrew, we're really happy to have you on. Thank you so much. Um, Let's go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over to you. And obviously the first question people always want to know is, all right, well, like, what is this thing? You know, why are we here? No, great. I mean, I think, I think that's exactly the thing we want to dive into first a little bit. Um, you know, once you have all the annoying kind of requirements gathering and what is it that we actually should be building questions out of the way that you were just referring to, and let's face it, those are typically very hard questions to solve. There comes a point in the life of any software development project or, or life cycle where you've got this code and you need to get it running somewhere uh, where somewhere can be many things. It can be, you know, you're building a SaaS platform and you actually want it running in a cloud. It can be that you're building something for consumers that needs to be, you know, put in a repository somewhere for download. It can be a mobile app. Um, it could be an IoT kind of set of functions or whatever, lots of different types of deliverables. Um, but there has to be a process where, you know, once you've built your code, you actually quote unquote deploy it, which means you, you take this release candidate that you have and you go through a sequence of sometimes simpler, sometimes more complicated steps that typically are around validating it and ensuring that it, it, it's good. Um, and then you put it live, like it goes into what you would consider a production state. Um, and that, you know, anybody who's ever had to do this um, quickly becomes a very kind of painful thing. If you're a developer, it often means trying to read through indecipherable uh, documentation to try to figure out what steps are needed to, to get your application published or deployed, messing around with CLIs, writing ye famous bash script of which we all have far too many. Um, and if you're an operator, if you're someone who's, you know, supposed to secure uh, or, or watch over your production environment, then very sure you've run into situations where you know people do things in an insecure way. They sign things with their personal machines. They deploy code that comes from their laptop as opposed to going through the company's approval process. And so there's this kind of dual challenge and tension around application deployment, which is on the one hand, if you're a developer, I want this to be as easy as it can possibly be. Just let me get my code running. Don't make me have a complicated time figuring out what to do. And then on the other side, from the operator's perspective, there's this question of how can I ensure this process, which will happen, you know, not just across one development team or one developer, but likely five or 10 or 50 or maybe hundreds of people if you're in a larger organization. How can I make sure this process is done in a sort of safe and consistent way that aligns with the organization's priorities and, and any legal requirements and so on that you have. 
Let's take a deep breath. That was a lot of text. Does that make any more sense to you, I think? Does that give you a better picture of what we're talking about here? Yeah, it absolutely does. One follow-up question I was going to say was how how many teams are typically involved and, ha and how many tools are involved uh, without the sun? <laughs> wow, yeah. Right. So how many developers does it take to, to, to screw in an application light bulb thing? <laughs> I mean, uh, this space is, you know, that's one of the things that is very challenging. This is a quite a complicated area if you if you go by DevOps or continuous delivery or CI, CD or the various names that this space kind of goes by. There's a proliferation of tools, all of which, if you look at them, kind of do almost the same thing. And so I'm sure one of the discussions we'll have a little bit down the line is in what circumstances do what tools make sense? and you know, how do I figure out what's right for me? I think broadly speaking, some of the things I was already talking about, which is, you know, what kind of requirements apply to the environment that you're in. If you're a developer in a startup, or if you're working out of your garage, say, then typically different requirements apply to you. than if you're a developer working in a larger organization, say in a bank or something like that. Um, but of course, also what you're deploying, like deploying a mobile app isn't quite the same thing as deploying to Kubernetes, for example. So there's a, there's a few factors that go into this choice. I think the main work point worth making it the here is that if you're looking at GCP or if you're already using GCP today, which I assume goes for most of our audience, then at some point application deployment will be a factor for you, whether you're the person running GCP for others to use or whether you're someone trying to build your own applications, whether it's AI, machine learning, big data, mobile, whatever, at some point you have to get this stuff running. And, and so application deployment will play a part in your GCP experience at some point in your life cycle. And we just want to make sure you understand what options are available for you and how you can make this thing painless, easy, safe, consistent, open, hybrid, you know, all the things that come into play here. Um, so you can see on the slide, I think it probably, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think with that yeah. said, I think it makes sense for us to, let's start getting getting into it. Exactly. Uh, can you tell us about uh, Spinnaker and exactly, you know, how it solves some of the problems that you just described. Yeah, let, let's dive into this. Let's let's go through a bit of an overview of what Spinnaker is, where it comes from and so on. So, you know, I've said a lot of what's on this slide already. Um, you know, some of the terms that that's some of the things that Spinnaker makes easy are things like blue green deployments, which you might have heard of, which means that you take a new version, but instead of just throwing it at all your users and hoping that it's okay, you know, you maybe test it first of all on a small subset of your users in something called a canary release, and then you give yourself the confidence that it actually does what you want it to do. And then you gradually roll out this new version to the entirety of your user base. Um, you might have manual judgments involved. You know, somebody has to approve a deployment before it goes live. And of course, in the unfortunate but usually, you know, case that does occur at some point where it wasn't quite what you expected, you want to have the ability to roll back instantly. So Spinnaker does all these kind of nice things for you. It's an, an open source project. Um, so you can go and look at the code and, and download and modify and contribute it yourself. It's originally out of Netflix. Google and Netflix have been uh, both contributing to the project very heavily in the last couple of years. And there's a bunch of other thought leaders in this space involved. Uh, I'll leave the links for uh, for further perusal. And I guess the sort of TLDR, if you like, the high level message about how Spinnaker is different from doing it yourself is that everybody who's tried to do this themselves over time ends up typically with a ball of mud of you know, various scripts and tools and so on. Um, and then, you know, Spinnaker is, is an alternative that hopefully makes this whole thing a little bit easier and a little nicer to understand and look at. So here you can see you know, quite a complicated process. We'll talk about it in the demo, which includes things like the build phase, you know, rolling out a new version for a subset of users, having a go, no go decision, and then either continuing to roll out to your full customer base or cleaning up after yourself. So you've you know, you've left a clean slate behind. That's the kind of thing that Spinnaker makes possible. So um, I actually wanted to interject there that kind of this idea of the ball of mud that I can imagine is pretty heavy. It takes a long time to move is yeah. app description. I think of what a lot of customers that I've talked to have said. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that I'm hearing is that people are really interested in just doing things faster, right? They want to go from, you know, quarterly releases to like hourly releases and there's just no way to do that using like custom scripting. Steph, are you, you know, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of pressure on customers today to 
you know, kind of go with that whole continuous deployment model where it, it's just, you know, faster releases and more frequent. But again, as you said, there's the caveat of how can you handle this effectively while still maintaining a safe protocol that aligns with the company initiatives. Yeah, which is a uh, thank you for the segue, if you like, to one of the other points I wanted to make here, which is is precisely that the process and the application modernization or digital transformation or whatever vocabulary is in use in your organization, they kind of go together um, in the sense that you know, as you're considering how to make things move faster, often companies look at things like microservices or re-architecture, you know, serverless, whatever. Um, part of making that work is also having a transition path from where you are today to this new world which might mean adopting new runtime platforms like kubernetes or cloud functions or those kind of things and so having a, a process engine a deployment engine that can handle this as you start migrating bits of your application out is almost as important as doing the re-architecting itself. And so the fact that you have this kind of multi-cloud hybrid capability where you know you might be migrating to a new cloud provider, or you might be trying to set up a multi-region set of a bunch of users, for instance, that deploy large global applications partially to AWS and partially to GCP, um, you still want one place to look at that. It's not fun to have two consoles open to try to understand whether your app is up in this cloud or down in the other cloud. Um, and similarly, if you're going from on-prem to the cloud, like migrating parts of your workload that can run in the cloud, you want to be able to see, here's my on-prem Kubernetes cluster, and this is what's running over there. And here's the GKE part or the part that's running in another public cloud. And this is how they go together when I roll them out. So you just touched on something that I think is really important, which is, again, something that I'm hearing from just about everyone I talk to, which is, you know, like, no, really, there are very few people are sort of betting their entire company and their entire business mm -hmm. on GCP or on any one cloud provider or any one even infrastructure delivery model, right? Uh, folks are, you know, they're looking at hybrid solutions. They're running Kubernetes on premise and in the cloud. Mm -hmm. They're looking at multi-cloud options, um, stuff. What, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah. And I think one thing that I'm hearing from you, Andrew, is that what you're saying is Spinnaker can kind of act as that central platform for you to write your code once and deploy it in a hybrid environment, whether it's in one cloud provider on premise. Is that is that true? Yeah, I think that that's exactly what we see a lot of users doing. So, you know, there's a, if you go out and do some searching on the site, you'll find a bunch of use cases of large users that are using this in, in exactly the scenarios you describe, either in a multi-cloud setup with ways had a very interesting talk at Next last year that, that's out there for public viewing where they're describing how they balance across different clouds and they have one pane of glass to understand the state of their application and their rollout process um, you know, from their source code, if you like, all the way through to production in the same way, uh, someone like Target who deploys in a hybrid setup where they have you know, multiple GKE clusters in this case, mm -hmm. running in different places, either for a single application or indeed spread across multiple applications. It's the fact that you have this consistency uh, that gives you also the choice of where you want to run things. Because if you think about from a sort of developer onboarding perspective, um, we all know how long it takes to get your IDE and your local build and so on set up. That's already like an enormous amount of pain typically. But then if you have to relearn an entire new delivery process and all the steps that go into deploying your application, that makes the kind of the, the ability to, to easily switch out from hybrid to on-prem to multi-cloud more painful and one of the nice things about Spinnaker is that it takes that pain away a little bit. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we've done a good job of setting up the problem space and talking about kind of what Spinnaker is going to do to make people's lives better. Yes. Let's, so uh, let's, let's do get, that. Yeah. Let's talk about, I think what people are really here for is sort of that next level of detail. Yeah. Um, just, you know, let's, t let's show us how dive it, right in. what it does. Yeah, I'm going to dive right in. I'm just going to quickly, I mean, just to point out that this, of course, integrates with your CI system or, or with your code. Um, what we're going to look at right now, we're going to kind of run through a quick demo that touches on not just Spinnaker, but of course, the other parts of the GCP stack that are related in this space. I mean, I think one of the big lessons we had this question a bit earlier is, wow, there's so many tools. What's important at the end of the day is the process that you can enable. The tools are sort of secondary. And so the process we're going to see here is we're going to commit some code. We're going to use cloud source repositories to trigger a build in Container Builder. 
Uh, we're going to build an artifact, a container. In this case, we're going to have some nice security scanning that goes on top of that that you kind of get for free as a developer because it's just integrated. Um, and then we're going to use Spinnaker to push it out, in this case, to GKE. But of course, we have other things in here. So, so that's the, the sort of demo flow that we're about to expect. Code change, build trigger, release candidate. And then we'll look at sort of the, some of the nice extra bonus things that Spinnaker gives you while that's in process. And with that, let me kind of switch over here, get out of the presentation. Uh, and start out with a cloud shell here. Let me just clear that, see whether that is, is that big enough for everyone? Here yeah, recently, that looks give, pretty good. Give me some, so that's big enough. Okay, so what we have here, the kind of setup, fairly simple. We have a sample application, nothing too crazy, running on some backend. In this case, it's GKE, but it could be running anywhere. Uh, and what we're going to do now is we're going to run through that flow. We're going to make some change. In this case, I think we're going to change the background color or something like that. And we're going to watch that run through um, a sort of CI CD flow. So let's have a look. Uh, we don't have any changes here. As you, you know, unsurprisingly, I've done this before uh, to try to appease the demo uh, gods. Let's make the appropriate change. That was me reverting earlier. So we're going to take this blue background color. We're going to do a nice uh, command line command here to, to turn that to blue, which should mean that we now have a change. Yes, uh, we're changing blue to orange. Well, that's very good. Now we're going to add that, and then we're going to commit it. And so we're now very clearly wearing a sort of developer hat here. Uh, blue to orange. There we go. Uh, let's see what the tags are. I'll talk about the importance of tags in a second. So there's V121. So let's tag this with V121. And then we're going to push this up to uh get push origin master tags all right so so much for the uh so much for the sort of basic development flow I could have done this from an ide could have done this from anywhere actually i did this from the cloud shell those of you gcp users that haven't used the cloud shell before i highly recommend it. it's great it's a really nice way to try these kind of things out conveniently also very good for demos so that's uh, that's very good for me so what we have now we we've, we've triggered this um this particular uh, code push and this is going to turn via a build trigger. As you can see, we've configured a build trigger here. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Um, you can see that we're triggering on a particular tag. We could trigger on all kinds of things. This is now going to turn, if I refresh my build history with a bit of luck, we're going to build a new container. So this is still upstream of Spinnaker, but this is part of the flow that you'd be going through. And so, once that comes up, we are going to be uh, while inside. Our, while the build is running, I wanted to uh, actually make a point that I think you had highlighted on the slide a few um, a few seconds ago, which is that Spinnaker really fits neatly into that full process, right? And I think you, mm -hmm. the slide that you brought up kind of illustrated it really well, which is um, it takes care of the delivery step in that process, right? Yeah. So it's not it's not going to manage your source code the way that a repository would. It's not going to do the build, right? It's not going to manage the art the art um, the artifacts, but it's very much the mechanism by which you take that artifact that is built and then deliver it to your production environment. Um, yeah, exactly. That That's exactly where to place it. To that um, end, we actually have a question on the chat. Yeah. Okay. The question is how Spinnaker compares to infrastructure automation software like Terraform, for example. An excellent question. Um, <laughs> Well, if I were if I were to put on my consultant hat, I would say it depends. Uh, I think the reality is that um, infrastructure automation, so Terraform would be a great multi-cloud uh, version of that, um, which which very much fits in the Spinnaker mold. GCP's flavor of that is deployment manager, for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, is a great way of describing a stack, if you like, um, that consists of kind of all the possible things that you could do in a public cloud, such as creating networking rules, you know, even accounts, uh, machines, clusters, all the kind of lower level stuff. Um, that can be used to define an entire application and roll that out all the time. Uh, which is almost like the sort of VM or virtual appliance model where you stand up an entire from the ground up application all the time. Um, one of the things that it can be challenging in that model is that you're basically rebuilding the house every time you make a small code change, as opposed to just, you know, make changing the background color of this thing. So the amount of, of change, if you like, or the, the, the magnitude of, of operations that you carry out every single time can be very big and potentially also quite slow. Um, what we see more frequently is that things like Terraform are used by the 
quote unquote operations team or the DevOps team or the platform team to define the underlying substrate, if you like the platform that your company runs on, things like firewall rules and, and you know networking configuration and sort of things that have quite a long lived life cycle. Whereas Spinnaker is what then goes and I like to say puts the icing on the cake, takes your application code from your various development teams and deploys it out to that setup um, so that you know you have your high iterating, fast moving, yet safe and secure application changes going into this platform. Of course, they combine very well uh, in, in use cases such as if you're building an integration testing environment, what we see quite frequently is that people will say, I've got this new release candidate. I'm gonna use something like Spinnaker to spin up using Terraform, say, a new environment, then I'm going to put my application in this environment, uh, run my tests against it, and when I'm done, I'm going to tear down that environment. When you look at production, spinning up an entire new production environment to deploy your application is a pattern we obviously see less frequently there. Typically, what you're trying to do is to modify an environment that already exists, especially if you're, you know, say Kubernetes is a great example. Terraform would be perfect to spin up your Kubernetes cluster, but it's a pattern we don't see very often that people in production will create a new Kubernetes cluster just to deploy their application. Instead, they will tell their existing prod cluster through something like Spinnaker, here's a new app version. Please go make that change for me. Awesome. That makes so some kind of sense. Some kind of both in conjunction. Yeah. Needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I think that the, the sort of the magic answer here is that all the tools can have a sort of one plus one equals three effect. They work really nicely together, but it's very challenging trying to figure out how and exactly where to combine them. Um, and that's what leads to a lot of the confusion in this space. Yuri, I just wanted to pick up on something you said. Yes, Spinnaker fits exactly in the deliver piece. And one of the reasons why it's useful to split out the different parts of this life cycle is that, of course, most organizations may have already made choices in this area. You know, if, you're, if you have in-house stuff that you've inherited or if you're working with other cloud providers, you may not be looking at an entire GCP end-to-end -end stack, although I would obviously highly recommend that you think about that. The nice thing about these kind of frameworks is we plug and play really well. And so, you know, if you want to use Spinnaker, but you are using an in-house CI system or a build system or an artifact repository, that's totally fine. And that will work just as nicely and give you the same kind of experience. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, as we're starting to get near our uh, the time that we're hoping to take uh, today, let's uh, let's have you show us the rest of the demo such that we can actually see Spinnaker at work. Exactly. Yeah, we, we've had so many interesting questions that we've kind of skipped over some of the some of the actual stuff going on. So let me let me catch up where we are in the demo flow right now. So the um, the new release, the new release candidate version has already been built. No, that tab was hidden. Here we can see that this is now being completed. Uh, we can drill through and see what it actually is, but that's not so relevant right now. And what has happened now is that in Spinnaker, a pipeline has already kicked off with this particular version that we had. You see, three minutes ago it started. So this is fully automated. And it's run through part of its flow already and is now at the stage where it's asking me, hey, do we really want to continue with this? And we are going to continue with that in a second. But before we do that, let's look at some of the details so we kind of see what we've what we've skipped over, if you like. And, and incidentally, for those viewers who were saying, oh, I wanted to follow this, this is exactly what painless deployment looks like. Like you don't actually go here. The nicest thing about deployments is if they just work. It's the same with your monitoring tools. You really don't want to go to those dashboards until things go wrong. So actually the experience we have so far is the experience we want. But let's talk a little bit about the process that we've run here. So what has happened here, we've based on that trigger, we have two parallel branches going on. We have a back end and a front end being deployed at the same time. Um, then we run integration tests against both of those in parallel. And if those both succeed, then we get to this go, no go scenario, which we're at now. That's this little stage here. And these two steps, which is to continue and deploy the new versions out to production have obviously not yet been carried out because we haven't made our decision yet. We have a lot of nice kind of debugging information and so on that we can look at. I am going to hit that go button in a second. But before, let me just briefly look at where we are at right now. So we can also see this is our kind of view of the world, if you like, that tells us where we're at. And we can see that we have the new version of the sample app. Specifically, we have one process of this sample app running in backend Canary. That's the new version. In production, we still have the old version. And 
uh, uh, you know, the reason I'm showing this is because one of the benefits of Spinnaker is that you get this single pane of glass to understand your application landscape as well from this perspective. And you know, this is one application running in one cloud, but you could have bits running in different public clouds or in hybrid, as we said. So let's go and let's hit this button and let's continue with this deployment. And now, you know, in a second, we're going to see um, the remainder of this deployment. Refresh the cache in a second, it'll get to that. Uh, we will see the remaining steps continue. They've now just started. So we're running the back end and the front end deployment. And once that's completed, uh, we will see an update of the state of our world as well. And then, of course, you can see it's already kicking off there. We are going to go on. You know, we're going to show the new application. Hopefully, the demo gods are kind to us and we will have uh, we will have an orange background in our application as well. So you just uh, actually showed us something that's really important that I think maybe people didn't really expect to see is the idea that you had an automated pipeline, but it required manual intervention. Yes, I was going to mention that as well. They're still required to have a person and actually push the code to production. Yeah, I, I think, and, and you know, for those who've, who've done some reading or on this topic, uh, you know, this gets into the fine distinction between continuous deployment and continuous delivery. Personally, I don't bother too much with the terms because easy to get hung up on terminology. The important thing, I think, as you both pointed out, is that you have options here. Uh, fully automated is great, and that's hopefully a point you'll get to as you start trusting uh, your systems and your, especially your tests to tell you what you need to know. But if you want to start out with some, some kind of, hey, let's have somebody take a quick look at this and then approve, you can do that not just once, but of course in multiple stages in the pipeline. And that's also one of the nice things that Spinnaker makes easy for you. Because of course you can script out a notification, like you can figure out what your SMTP servers or send a notification to Slack or whatever. But actually doing that properly, having reminders, making it well formatted, making people understand what they're looking at, that's the kind of stuff that is not fun. And here you can see that basically designing and editing these pipelines is a really simple process. And each of these steps has a lot of smarts built in. So there are things that we can apply here. If we look at the details of this thing, for instance, we have all these great deployment strategies at our disposal, like red-black deployments, which you may also know as blue-green or Highlander or various other things. You may not need them for your simple kind of demo application, but if you ever get to the point that you do need them, and that's part of this deployment maturity process, they're not very fun uh, to script out yourself. And so it's great to have them here. I guess it's important to maybe take this a step further and point out that, yes, you can design your own pipelines easily, but more interestingly, you can also just get pipelines from other people. Again, putting on the developer hat, you really don't want to have to bother with how this process works. What you would like is to be able to take a recommended pipeline either from you know someone like GCP itself as a, as a provider or from your company's like release engineering experts or even from a blog post if you like their particular pattern and consume it inside something like Spinnaker uh, just as like a community resource in the same way as you would a, a Terraform module or something like that. And so Spinnaker enables some quite powerful process sharing as well in that way. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, right. So let's just finish off, round up that demo. Let's see whether, uh, yeah, what a surprise. It actually worked. Wonderful. So, okay. So we're, we're now at this new version. And uh, if we get round to it, let's see how we go with questions and so on. We can go back and, and do a rollback as well, you know, pull the pull the parachute, pull the ripcord. Um, but for now, let, let's just see what we have in terms of additional topics or questions we want to discuss. Awesome. Thank you so much. So hopefully that kind of gives people a good understanding of uh, certainly the the introduction to Spinnaker, which is what we we're hoping to accomplish today, help people understand how maybe, maybe they can get started with uh, you know CD if they haven't been doing it before. Yeah, it definitely gave me a great overview. Yeah, and we're, we're both much better educated. We're experts now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, Steph, do you have any, any, do you have any uh, questions on the chat we should, uh, we should answer? Yeah, there's one last question that is, uh, essentially you might have covered this a bit earlier, um, whether you can achieve rolling updates with Spinnaker, and if, for example, you needed to create a new image or template, uh, and roll it into an instance group, then would that be, you know, kind of possible to mix provisioning and deployment? Yes, uh, the answer to both is yes. And, and in fact, that's a, a great, you know, a great question about specifically the idea that you want a deployment process that covers different types of runtime platforms. So here we've done a container deployment, but if you're using a managed instance group in something like GCE, there's a little bit of extra work that's required to make the deployment work. Um, but that is handled by Spinnaker's GCE provider out of the box as well. So there's a thing we call a bake stage, which is, you know, take my artifacts that I've published from my development process, 
wrap them up in a VM, uh, do that with the right base image that I've configured, produce that as an outcome, take that, update a managed instance group, and then do all the sort of tricky and, and quite complicated things to make sure the managed instance group does the rolling update properly. So things like, let me just skip this, uh, things like, you know, making sure that as you add new instances, the percentage of traffic that goes to them matches what you've accepted for the rolling update so you don't have too many users exposed to the new version at any given point in time adding new instances to this group to match your policies so that you know you have your rolling procedure and then moving the load balancer over getting rid of the old instances doing all that kind of cleanup that is not fun to script yourself spinnaker does that for you out of the box and that's what i call automation it's <laughs> finest <laughs> awesome well done well andrew Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. I think this is certainly fantastic for us. I feel like I learned a lot. I definitely did as well. All right, folks on the line, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. We really appreciate it. Come back on Thursday morning. We'll have another exciting topic talking about using uh, BigQuery. And then we've got a couple of great sessions lined up for next week as well. We'll have um, another partner, Elastic, will be here in the building with us, which we're really excited about. Um, and the, the GCP Live World Tour continues. Yeah, we're almost at episode 50, so keep sticking with us. Yeah. All right, Andrew, thank you again. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.